It's a pleasure this morning for our third and final plenary session to introduce Professor Christoph Gorski from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's going to be speaking about the status of cosmological parameters from the cosmic microwave background. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let me start it up and see if everything's right. All right, so um, this talk is, uh, has been uh, put under title request as, as stated, and I will deal mostly with phenomenological part of how far we have progressed in the field of microwave background. Yesterday we heard the lovely review of the history of the field by John Mather, and uh, that will leave me with filling in the details on where we are now. So this is a jubilee year for microwave background. 50 years ago, we've been made aware of it in a sense of proclaiming that we knew what was out there. It's been measured before and not realized what it was, as John described yesterday. We've been tremendously privileged to have lived through the last couple of decades. As this graph illustrates, we have seen successful execution of three satellite missions devoted to measurements of this uh, phenomenon, plus a large number of um, suborbital experiments on the ground balloons and so forth, which were doing essential work and are still doing essential work in the field and will be doing most essential work for the foreseeable future as the future in space is at this point unclear. Um, it's good to reflect on where it puts us in trying to understand the universe. This diagram, amongst many that people put in a cartoonish way to illustrate what we know about the universe, shows us uh, this, this cocoon kind of situation. We're living in a bubble uh, in the middle, observing the universe around us. We're surrounded by impenetrable surface. Microwave background is the all this light that comes to us from this surface depicted. Oh, OK, so already. How does the pointer work? Sorry. Is there a green pointer I can use or not? <laughs> Could I borrow one? I'm sorry. I thought there was one on stage here. Um, anyway. Uh, It took us a while to understand what's going on, but now everything is firmly in place. This picture is the foundation of, um, of the model of the universe that we use to put everything in context. What it's supposed to indicate is that um, for those who practice microwave background, and for them this is the source of astronomical signal, we're about measuring photons, which mostly come from here, but by now, we reach the stage in, in the field in which everything that's on the way is probed. And uh, what I will mostly talk about this Planck mission later on is sensitive to pretty much everything that's in the universe on the way. All this light in the universe emitted when the universe was about 370,000 years old. After Big Bang, it was still hot, just about to cool enough to become transparent. It was quite simple, filled with known matter and radiation, dark matter, as astronomy told us for a while. It must have been seeded with initial fluctuations that we try still to understand and for which we have some ideas to be put in firm place. And 3,000 Kelvin or redshift 1,000 is significant because the universe became transparent at that time and, and since then we see what's going on. CMB radiation is the biggest reservoir of energy in the electromagnetic domain. It contains about 95% of known radiation in the universe. And basically, this bottom line here, almost of the screen, sets up the whole thinking about this model. We take stuff so far back that things are relatively simple and relatively easy to describe in physical models. 
when these models are formulated, we strive for simple parameterization with very few dimensions, and we try to throw it against observations and, and confront it. That's all there is. So st such standard model of cosmology has emerged over those several decades. It's a huge collective endeavor. More astronomy comes into it than CMB. CMB is one of the pillars of it. Generally, it's embedded in general relativity. The background is known mostly through CMB to be very close to homogeneous isotropic, and of course, it's expanding as we knew before we know, knew CMB. It's accelerating, as Supernova told us. It must have had something fairly exotic for most people, like cosmological inflation, which produced those initial seeds from which all astronomical structures have emerged. Present thinking is that this is the imprint of quantum fluctuations, that through specific mechanisms of hyper-fast expansion have been brought to macroscopic, hypermacroscopic scales of the whole universe. To zero order, well, we know that there are density perturbations, so we first focus in building the minimal model on, on, on that sector, adiabatic, nearly scale invariant perturbations with very simple statistics. All of these features to be tested through measurement and confronted with more expanded version of theory. So, in minimal parameterization, we know a lot about radiation, so we put fixed amount of CMB photons and known neutrinos in the model. On top of that, we give it baryonic matter with parameterized amount to be measured. Cold dark matter, likewise. We put a parameter which is very useful in mathematical setting of the model of the size of the sound horizon at the last scattering surface. So the size within which perturbations could talk to one another roughly speaking, at the time of emission of microwave background. Then we use the parameter that describes the residual ionization fraction of the universe on the way. It must have, at some point, become not completely neutral, and it didn't. We try to measure that. It's a difficult measurement. And finally, a couple of parameters describe the simplest part of the spectrum of perturbations that probably emerged from something like inflation. It's slope to zero order and overall amplitude. When these are set from the model, you can derive other parameters that correspond to astronomically measurable quantities. So again, in just names, uh, the description of initial spectrum connects us to very early in the universe if inflation was indeed what caused that spectrum to emerge. Matter content of the universe or energy content energy density content connects us to this kind of first few minutes universe of Weinberg. And uh, this is a geometric descriptor that connects us also to low redshift physics, and, and that's just phenomenology of what happened in the universe on the way. So, of course, since Kobe discovered CMB anisotropy in 92, there have been hyperdramatic improvements in the quality of these measurements. The field from Data starved became data rich. People used to joke about precision cosmology. It's not an oxymoron anymore. And, uh, and in fact, we've experienced a little bit of a race on determining these cosmological parameters. So just on the eve of Planck in 2013, coming up with the first set of scientific results, uh, our friends and competitors inheriting WMAP legacy and banding it with extremely powerful ground experiments, ACT and SPT, that provide information on much smaller angular scales with great precision, put together the spectrum that showed us to this precision uh, what's on the sky. This is angular spectrum, large scales, small scales, Doppler peaks, all of that. That can be fitted through this simple model that I just stated. And the expression of that fit is that table from their paper that emerged just about a month before Planck published its first results. So personally, I'm extremely slow reading stuff like that, so I won't attach you to it. It's just as a record that it was out there. If you want to read it, it's in the paper that's published. The whole point is to show that just very recently, of course, in February, we put out the latest edition of this table based on Planck data. So the situation 
the question is now how is this going to evolve into the future. From Planck perspective, we argue it's not going probably to evolve too much on most of these parameters because Planck was designed as a machine to measure temperature perturbations to precision that would allow to establish this output in science with longevity and, and legacy value to it. Whether you believe this statement, I won't have time to argue. Of course, it's argued for in 60 pages of the parameters paper, which was put out. So if you want to agree or disagree with it, you'll be my guest. I will try to put a little bit of presentation of, of various phenomenological points that, that may support that belief. So I would move to conclusions. I won't read through them. I did that for a joke because I've seen a few speakers yesterday struggling at the conclusion section. I wanted to do conclusions first, so we, we're doing very well. It's not just Planck. There has been an aggregation of data from many experiments that put us in a very privileged position in this field. We're happy. There is a model that's simple. It fits rather well glass half full, half empty kind of perspective always leaves us with, and we do it in our paper, with, with, with attempts to look for caveats and where as simple a model as that does not do the job. We simply failed to invalidate that, that relatively trivial model and we considered a number of extension of the parametrization that I put forward and, uh, and they haven't indicated anything extraordinary. So let's see how that all stands. This is just uh, now moving on to appendices after conclusions. <laughs> A plot from 2003, uh, to, no, 2005, three year of integration in the sky uh, by WMAP project made them put this sort of schematic diagram together. I like these diagrams because there are theory curves on them, but the points are actual data. It, in, it shows that WMAP measured temperature quite well and with a large number of bins, got a little bit more sparse on uh, cross-correlation of temperature and polarization, although it measured some and had speculative statements on E-mode polarization in fact, this point here, of course, illustrates what drifted the most in, in WMAP results with extraordinary claims about very high redshift or reionization first, which left them drifting towards smaller and smaller values throughout the duration of the mission. This plot is the replacement it's based on maybe one year aggregation of the data from now back. Lyman Page made it, I think, or somebody made it for him. I got it from him. It is, it is truly that's just a statement of extraordinary situation that we're, we're in. So uh, just to take it through in a minute, temperature spectrum that WMAP was struggling for, WMAP they didn't even put on. This is not Planck plot, but there are only Planck data here merged with high resolution SPT act points at higher end quite dense set of measurements on polarization, EE spectrum, so-called scalar polarization, and the emerging good dense uh, crowding of points on, on the lensing component of the B-mode spectrum. So what are they? Just two-dimensional cut through, through that ball in the beginning, Planck in the middle, sees the universe or whoever, any observer, sees the universe, most of the radiation comes from last scatter and redshift 1000, goes through the universe, and now, as I already said, these photons interact with things on the way and we detect that. So it interacts through gravity, react to perturbations in, in, in curvature on the way, and they interact astrophysically as well with hot gas, like in Sunya and Zeldovich clusters, for example. All of these effects are detected, measured with increasing precision. Lensing itself is the effect that simply perturbs the path, preserves the surface brightness, but causes the effect that is illustrated briefly like this. If the primary temperature field on top, on some segment of the sky looks like that, and the associated scalar polarization with, you know, more than order of magnitude drop in, in, in amplitude is illustrated here. And if we put on the simulated sky no 
B mode polarization, no inflationary signal from gravitational waves, and then we let it lands, it changes, and the changes in the top two panels illustrate just focusing, defocusing, geometry change in that field. Incidental on the line of sight effect is only a couple of arc minutes, but it's coherent according to the underlying matter density over some degree scales. It's all detected in various ways, as you may have heard, to significant, enormous, significant precision by Planck and others. And then B mode just can be generated by lensing of the E mode. So even if there wasn't primordial signature, we will see some. And that's, in fact, exactly what we see. So this part here is universe talking on the way, processing this signal and us measuring it. Very nice, indeed. So what's left to be done is there is a bit of a broken line drawn, primordial contribution driven by gravity waves, the one we haven't measured yet, the one people thought they measured with bicep. We'll come back to that. And there is the reionization feature which WMAP was limiting, we're now coming up with Planck saying what we think about it. It's not indicated as well measured. It is still not very well measured compared to everything else. So I managed that in about 15 minutes, so maybe we'll manage the rest. So now let's focus on, on, on how all of this stuff emerged. Um, Planck as shown on the first transparency, was the third generation space mission dedicated to CMB measurements. Um, it's European Space Agency's mission. It's not operating anymore. It's, it's done in space. We're still working on the data. NASA is a junior partner, so the formal statements say ESA mission with significant participation of NASA, but we need to take pride here on American soil since essential hardware elements and quite a lot of human contributions to Planck were actually paid for by NASA and contributed from JPL and elsewhere in the country. These are Planck's eyes, focal plane of the cool plate of horns coupling to bolometers, the most sensitive detectors. This is in operation used to be the coldest object in the solar system, they said. I don't know if it's really true, but 100 millikelvins is pretty good. Then outside, there are horns of low-frequency instrument. All of that looks at the sky through this 1.6-meter mirror. And importantly, as it went to space and until today hasn't been surpassed, it was an instrument that stretched large range of frequencies, which is important because on this diagram illustrating what's on the sky, working against us trying to get cosmological signals, which is foregrounds in the galaxy and elsewhere, in temperature shows this, this composite story where we have dust emission. This is frequency electromagnetic spectrum, so dust emission uh, shown against synchrotron, free-free, and, and spinning dust contributions. 100 gigahertz is a breakpoint between typically radiometric and bolometric detection techniques. Minimum here in, in foregrounds, around 70 gigahertz or so, where you see the CMB the best. In polarization, free-free is not polarized. We don't know much about spinning dust. Anyway, we think principal foregrounds are dust, and free-free should be a little easier problem. Planck observed at seven polarized frequencies on the sky. Uh, this is only to show the duration of the mission. Originally proposed for 15 months, eventually observed for 29 with high-frequency instrument and 48 or 50 with low-frequency instrument. They say dollars in space or euros weigh less. They still weigh enough not to make this longer. WMAP observed for nine years. This is the duration of the mission for Planck. It was effectively finance limited. Maps, that's going to be the legacy that will last for a long time. 
It's, as I said in the beginning, it's not clear right now what the future of CMB in space is. For temperature, these measurements, Planck was designed to be sort of ultimate instrument, and I think a lot of people think it's delivered beautifully. So these are the three low frequencies, six high frequencies. These three, that's the least noisy one. Sorry. Yeah, these, and these three are principal conduits for squeezing that cosmological information out of Planck and parameters. Thank you. We have to fit what has been before Planck. This diagram, I think, rather nicely aggregates the data of Planck and WMAP. There was a little bit of push and shove when Planck came out. We've been making statements about perhaps some inconsistencies with WMAP and so forth. Right now, most of that's been resolved. I think we have a lovely data set from 20 to 100 gigahertz. That's already HFI, but red ones are Planck, three frequencies. Blue ones are WMAP. We have nice coverage of the frequency space. We have less nice coverage in sense of achievement in the noise level. Hemped or, or radiometric techniques are less sensitive than bolometric. As I indicated with foregrounds for secondary mission targets, this is the richer part of the field. Unfortunately, it's less well measured. Um, we do some simple tests on comparing this data. It's easy. Poor man's component separation allows you to take. So for example, here is an interesting case of intermission comparison. So high frequency Planck 100 versus close 95 gigahertz. WMAP difference indicate dropping CMB signals where they're consistently measured and revealing CO emission in the galaxy that 100 gigahertz channel sort of serendipitously picked up. So that's pretty funny, actually, for insider sort of joke. <clears throat> anyway, this diagram now up to 1500 in L kind of illustrates how three raw renditions of spectra for Planck compared to WMAP, likelihood inputs which aggregate this and 217, all of that you can put in errors and, and get a nice emerging picture of consistency of space measurements. Component separations uh, schemes are multitude, the one oriented at maps and, and high fidelity separation with the frequency coverage we have in Planck allows us to break these temperature foregrounds into number of components, which I will not discuss, allows you to make new renditions of these color pictures. This is supposed to illustrate four color addition of what we learned about foregrounds. So CMB not present on this picture, and then what was missing is CMB, which you have seen a lot. This is where we fit cosmology. And then polarization. Polarization is uh, that's the legacy of WMAP. Interesting. So QU stokes, maps, polarization amplitude derived from them, and then polarization angle. I'm only showing this because that's not going to change. That's fixed. That's solid. And it shows problems that, as Lyman Page told me a couple of weeks ago, he realized in horror now. They, they kind of went through post-traumatic stress disorder, I think, with the difficulty of work with polarization. One has to appreciate that. This is what we're going through now. Planck data looks like that in comparison. We have released so far the first top three low frequency instrument frequencies, so that's out, and 353 gigahertz for monitoring dust. These are still not released as we are working on refining final picture of what systematic is present there. We did, though, of course, internally separate them component-wise, and, and the result of that, we're showing this because we think it's most secure for the low-frequency and high-frequency foregrounds and their footprints and polarization to be shown rather than subdominant small in amplitude polarization signal, which is not good enough to be distributed freely. F f uh, synchrotron and dust maps, just blown up versions thereof. You can derive the magnetic field structure in the galaxy from, from, from that. It all looks very nice. I mentioned that tau parameter measurement is very difficult. Indeed, it is. There are some redundancies, though, that allowed us to move in and, 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 and release uh, our statement about it now. Temperature spectrum alone allows to make a statement which is not competitive with WMAP-based, polarization-based 
uh, inference of it when we kick in Planck polarization, basically just, just, just that red curve, broken curve is what we now advocate for usage and likelihood. I won't have time to discuss that in detail, except for stressing very hard, not measured very well. These are not, ex these are not statements of excellent measurement. So again, these raw maps uh, are shown here to, to, to reinstate that these three frequencies have been used with extensive cutting of the sky to produce these spectra compared here between 2013 and 14 for illustration of slight change in calibration of Planck data and improvement in noise performance. Then parameters are fitted to these spectra principally, so one basically has to understand how they change if some parameterization of the model starts drifting. So this is an illustration of a lower and higher range of error of six parameters that are of interest to us how varying them individually by 1% impacts the shape of that spectrum. So that's the principal drive to likelihood parameter estimation. We help ourselves by including very significantly measured lensing, potential power spectrum, and then we also kicked in polarization. So these are Planck TE cross-correlation, uh, EE correlation that enter the likelihood. Now to, to close it in with uh, suborbital experiments, of course this, the beauty of the situation is that Planck now on TE and EE gets pretty much spent by about 1500 in L, but that curve is based on temperature data in Planck and it goes through measurements aggregated from these suborbital efforts going to much higher Ls as the driving instruments here are one arc minute resolution and much more sensitive than Planck. So that picture holds in phenomenologically just absolutely splendidly. And its, it's, it's uh, other element is BB spectrum, which recently got the SPT points added with high significance on top of previously measured ones. There will be some talks in another session about SPT and ACT. Um, before my uh, clock stops, let me just briefly state uh, that we entered a, a, a liaison with bicep Keck collaboration. Of course, they came up with a pretty dramatic statement that their very deep measurements on very small field on 2% of the sky perhaps carried the footprint of inflation and polarization signals. Well, as the story is very well told now, Planck's 353 polarization measurements on the small field around here on the sky, inaccessible to them before, allowed to put the new light on it. I will not go into the details of the analysis, but you have to work on Planck data quite a bit to bring them to the form directly comparable to BICEP. What it makes immediately clear is, when you do it correctly, is that temperature is very consistently measured. Planck is noise dominated on such a small field but it has enough signal due to foreground emission that cross-correlation reveals it. So these are original bicep Keck and Keck array cross-correlations, which at relatively low L, shooting here, showed the excess that was interpreted as primordial. When different in shape dust polarization spectra are measured in cross-correlation here with Planck 353 and scaled in frequency law to correspond to drop from 353 to 150 gigahertz, they render amplitude which is significant in conjunction with biceps own measurements. So of course that led to revision of the original statement. The likelihoods got weakened and then the final rendition in the paper recently published shows that while there is mild preference for some non-zero value of the tensor component uh, on the sky, it's not bounded in likelihood away from zero. So at this point, it's just an upper limit. Um, I don't have time now to go into the new stage of suborbital experiments. It gets very impressive. ACT recently fielded very wide frequency focal plane going from 30 gigahertz to 230, which then with 350 from Planck will produce good coverage of, of the foreground, uncharacteristic of, of suborbital experiments. So we're getting into the era of these beasts, which 
are much more sensitive, have much higher angular resolution, are becoming, beginning, beginning to get the, the very decent frequency response in the focal plane, they're just lacking the sky area. So if we could just put HACT or SPT in space, now that would be awesome. I guess it's probably not gonna happen very soon. The future of the field remains to be seen. There are large groups which think that a lot of work can be done from the ground, if not all. There are those who think that this here thing, primordial B modes at low L or large angular scales, and even reionization bumps are never gonna be measured to sufficient precision from the ground, and we should contemplate another space mission. I surely hope we would see it. It's not a fast business, although it's not infinitely small. Like I said in the beginning, we've seen three successful missions deployed. It will probably take a couple of decades before we see another big one. Let's hope there will be a smaller one on the way. This doesn't require a behemoth mission. I think we can get away with a modest spacecraft that could address these issues very well. So let's hope for it. Support your local sea embologists and let's look forward to the future. Thank you. We open the floor for questions, but please approach one of the microphones so we can hear your question clearly. Sorry, I didn't see you back there. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. You can walk, I can't. Uh, the low value of L equals 2. The value of what? The low value at L equals 2. Oh, the quadrupole? Yeah. Okay, so take it from the back. So the, there is the idiosyncrasy of the microwave background sky that has been known on the point of L equal 2 already since COBE reinforced by WMAP and then expanded further. It's not just L equal to issue, it's just the whole low L spectrum of the temperature perturbations up to 30 or 40 has features in it which don't just outright fit the, uh, the model all that well. There is a little bit of visibility of this dip here and there is L equal to. Of course, these are modes subject to considerable fluctuation in terms of cosmic variance. We have a single shot measurement at five degrees of freedom in the quadrupole, so it's an interesting question whether there is anything to worry about at all. It's, of course, also the, most, the one most subject to uncertainties in foreground corrections, how much sky you get and so forth. So technically, it's a little bit of an involved feel. I think predominant opinion is that St that since the statistical power of the fit is carried through all of those seven or eight peaks right now to, to just enormous precision, it overrules idiosyncrasy here and it's not clear if it tells us anything new. People speculate, do inflationary fits with features on these spectra. None of that is conclusive at the moment, it's considered weak evidence. On the age or Hubble constant problem, there are very different uh, ways to the Hubble constant, whether you do CMB work or whether you do astrophysical, astronomical work. So yes, there is a little bit of a tension. I think it's uh, almost grotesque to call it so in view of the history of that field, since 50 to 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec was the range that people were happy with for decades, and now it's shrunk to two or three in so-called tension, I, I personally would caution against getting agitated against it. But some people are. They think that, uh, of course, riding on top of Hubble Space Telescope effort, measuring Cephades very well and so forth, you cannot dismiss it too easily. Consistently CMB data, which are model-dependent fits on Hubble constant, synchronized now between WMAP and Planck, everything we have, show somewhat low values compared to uh, the other ones, astronomical ones, so to speak. Baryon acoustic oscillation measurement, which also is geometric in nature, has nothing to do with CMB, points out to lower values, and then astrophysical ones, based on supernovae, point to higher values. Typically, in the history of astronomy, I think it indicated problems with astrophysics. It's complicated. We never really know. We like to think that CMB is simpler. I will leave it there. Okay. If these 
Tensions persist. If they don't go away, as we have stated in the parameters paper, it will indicate eventually that the model has to be expanded and perhaps that gives us a window on something new to be imported into it. On purely statistical basis right now, I think there is no prevailing opinion that we're already there. Okay. The other ones are N and sigma H, is that right? N and sigma, sigma, sigma eight. 8. That's right. So Again, there's some differences. N, uh, well, I don't know about N. Yes, sigma 8, of course, sigma 8 is the strength parameter that measures the amplitude of the spectrum. Derived from CMB, it comes uh, a little high. And again, it's rather interesting that it already came high with COBE, with much poorer range of scales and, and uh, quality measurements available to us, that comparison, it's, it's absolutely amazing that already then in the 90s, people who do cluster work try to measure what clusters of galaxies tell us about cosmology indicate is significantly lower. What, what is sigma 8 for non-practitioners is just a variance measure of fluctuations in 8 megaparsec sphere as an overall strength uh, measure for density perturbation power spectrum. So. It's one of the parameters in CMB. It's, uh, it's measured through different means, through galaxy counts, cluster counts, things like that, which involve interpretation steps, which some people are uncomfortable with. So yes, there is a discrepancy. It's not closed. It's not dramatic, but it's persistent. It's characteristic of these fields over length scales longer than Planck's existence. So I don't think that we, we have imported that into astronomy. We just have to understand that at some point. Okay. One last quick question, so we can move on. Uh, on this 100th anniversary of general relativity, um, we can ask, uh, to what extent does the reduction of the data depend on general relativity? To what extent is it a test of it? And to what extent it is, in, is it independent of it? As Unably as I could, I tried to emphasize the phenomenological element in, in what I was showing you. So most of the measurements of these spectra are actually independent of general relativity. So well, 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 after all, we put an instrument in space. It measures voltage change on some detector. You sequence it in time, get it through scanning strategy, and you try to translate it into physical unit of what you think the temperature changes in front of your detector and you put it geometrically on the sky and that's all you do. So when you make the maps, I don't think there is really any import of general relativity. Then spectrum, you compute on these maps and it's uh, also free from it. Then there are foregrounds, has nothing to do with general relativity much. And then, then there is the interpretation. So if, if we, if we have a few points, like at this point, say, with attacking R or, or B modes and all of that, and a lot of model import in the likelihood construction is important, then yes, you should be aware of it. And we've been in that situation with temperature perturbations long time ago. Right now, I think phenomenology prevails, and perturbations themselves tell us something about the universe which, which only an inference process gets connected to general relativity. So yes, the model as I structured it, of course, is embedded in general relativity. And then, then that's an interesting question. There are people who even argue you shouldn't be importing uh, Friedman, Robertson, Walker metric into it. You should just measure, say, quadruple, octuple, low order multiples and make statements about how far around you is the metric description imported from isotropic background with just matter or energy density uh, content driving expansion and so forth, is that even admissible? Um, it's a matter of taste. At some point, you, you wonder. I think that, uh, well, lensing is another interesting point, right? I mean, all the lensing, bending formulae are general relativistic. Precision of that is not at the level of, of uh, trying to see deviations from general relativity. The framework works. So far, we haven't seen a problem. So um, roughly speaking, thank that you. would be my simple answer. And thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.